We have a special event this evening. We're going to tour two really wonderful exhibitions that are at Traver Gallery right now, an exhibition um, by April Surgeon and an exhibition by John Kiley. Um, and April and John are here with us to kind of walk us through their shows, tell us a little bit about this particular body of work um, and a little bit about their process and answer any questions that you all have. Um, if you haven't done one of these tours with us before, we have Deb on camera tonight. I'm going to go ahead and spotlight her. So you should be able to see that nice and large. Um, and then uh, we're going to ask all of you to turn off your cameras and to mute your mics for the tour portion. And then when we rejoin um, at the end, uh, we'll have about 10 or so minutes to have you all um, join us on camera, ask any questions you have of the artists, um, share your thoughts, comments, etc. cetera. Um, so I'll go ahead and ask you to turn off cameras now, except for John and April, who will stay on camera with us. Thank you. And I think that probably just about everyone who's joined us here knows both of these artists, but um, it is also fun to get to introduce them because they're good friends and amazing people. So um, let's just, I'm going to take a minute and introduce both of them. Um, I'll start with April since that's whose work we're looking at here. Um, April's been working with this cameo engraving technique uh, for well over, can I say two decades, April? Uh, well, Almost, 2003, oh. <laughs> um, and this, yeah. uh, this newest body of work is really um, taking it to the next level, um, as you'll see when we walk through the show. Uh, the show title is The Sea Lives with Light, and this is a series of seascapes, um, as you'll see, and uh, from all over the Pacific Ocean um, and from a number of different uh, sort of field work excursions that April has taken throughout her career. That's one of the things that has really drawn me towards April's work is her commitment to doing this type of field work and really being immersing herself in her subject matter and really understanding um, what it is that she's depicting and how she's creating an object that can build connection between the viewer and the subject matter and um, really extend that relationship in a meaningful way. Um, and then John Kiley, who is also with us here tonight, um, has been showing with the gallery. I think this is your 11th year because last year was your 10th anniversary with the gallery. Um, yeah, and 11 years, I think. Yeah, I think so. Um, but has been working with glass for much longer than that. Um, and of course has worked on Dale Giuli's team and Lino Talia Pietra's team in addition to doing his own amazing work. Um, and this particular body of work that we'll see tonight is an extension of the Fractograph series. Um, so John will explain a little bit about how he approaches that work and how this is a different um, kind of conceptual series from the previous ones. And looking forward to touring with you, John, thanks. So thanks you guys for joining us. April, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, jump in here with you. Um, can you tell us what we're looking at here? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I guess I'll start with the overall concept of the show. Um, I made this over the period of, of the last year and I guess obviously before that was 2020 and we all know what that represents. So I guess during the, the last year and a half, two years, I've been thinking a lot about the research that I've had the opportunity to partake in over the last um, 10 or so years. And I was thinking a lot about why, um, why kind of the pelagic environment is so important to me and, and why the oceanscape um, really resonates with me and why it's important to me. And I think that often talking about these things is is a lot harder than it is to show them. So this body of work to me really is a visual representation of some of the more remarkable experiences that I've had um, throughout, throughout the Pacific Ocean. Um, and for me also, this work is built on, on 
prior bodies of work that talk about uh, climate change. And that's, of course, what all the research is that I've been um, working on has been related to. But I think that often art can be a journey on um, the development of an idea. And, and I, I hope that this show can kind of build on a viewer's um, idea or experience of a pelagic uh, environment. And so um, that's what, what this show is about. This so if, piece is, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna ask, um, so what we're looking at here is actually a, a glass engraving, which yep. um, I know it's sometimes hard to see on <laughs> camera because they do look so photographic in some ways or painterly. Um, and they kind of flatten out on camera, but maybe Deb can get a little side view for folks who can see the, the depth here. Yeah. And so with these pieces, I really tried to create that sense of a pelagic environment, which is, um, a, has, is a lot about kind of fog and water and atmosphere. And I really tried to capture those kind of wet and dry moments or cloudy moments and, um, and, and capture that in, in the work. The, it's, this body of work too is a little bit different because of the format that I've engraved on um, large single panels um, versus small tiled work. And anybody that's familiar with my work will know that I usually work in small tiles. So this, this was pretty exciting to work on. Um, setting my studio up to make this type of work has been a dream for a really long time. And um, I finally set my studio up to do it. So it was really exciting. And it was all really inspired by a residency that I had at um, the Bullseye Glass Factory in 2007. I was corrected. It, I, I wrote it was 2008, but it was actually 2007, but. And so what does that mean? What, you um, what so when you talk about how this is um, a much kind of larger scale than you've been able to work on before. How did you change your studio and your approach to making that allowed for that? Yeah, so traditionally, um, the way that I've been engraving, I mean, not, not necessarily traditionally for engraving, but how I've been working is from a cameo, uh, is far, sorry, from an engraving lathe where um, I bring up if, let's say, I have my, I have my catalog here, let's say, I, um, I have this as a glass panel. Normally what I would be doing is bringing the glass up to a wheel that would be turning and moving the panel around to move to, in, to remove the material. Um, these panels are way too heavy and too big to lift up to a wheel to remove the material. So I've actually invested in some hand tools which allow me to bring the tool to the material to remove the material. And there's all sorts of different bits that I can use. I have um, some bits that can, you know, do fine details, or I have have some wheels that can remove large materials of, of large materials at, at one time, if that makes sense. I'm not sure. Yeah, absolutely. I imagine that that um, really changes uh, your sort of ability to uh, see the whole canvas at one time. Exactly. And... Yeah. So at this, so when I first had the opportunity to work in this style, it was at the um, Bullseye Glass Factory at this residency with Yerji, and Yerji was so excited about it because, you know, he was traditionally working on even smaller work than I was, and to have the opportunity just to work on something really big without having it broken up between multiple panels um, just is incredibly freeing. And I think anybody who works in that um, tile format uh, understands, <laughs> understands that it's complicated to try and match up uh, all the tiles. Yeah, this definitely. Piece, oh, sorry, this piece oh, was, here. Sorry, April, I was just gonna point out how you get this uh, sorry, there's always that little weird delay on Zoom. <laughs> it's like, um, but I was just going to point out how you get this incredibly smooth kind of ethereal surface where the, that continuous um, sort of gradient uh, uninterrupted by the sort of grid lines is quite amazing. Yeah, it's um, one thing about the, the gentle gradients that kind of seems like an easier thing to achieve, but it's um, quite tricky to achieve 
smooth gradients like that. And uh, I, I really enjoyed the challenge of, in, of engraving like that for sure. When you have more, um, I guess in some of the other, the atmosphere study pieces, they have the texture of the water where you can kind of play with the nuances of the glass where in the flat areas where the fog is, um, it's, it's a lot more, more nuanced to work in those areas. And here I tried to play with kind of the foreground and background um, and the light that you, you see in the water and of course the glare that's always a part of the marine environment um, as well. So what, um, can you talk a little bit about your connection to the ocean and why the Pacific Ocean plays such a large part um, in your work? Yeah, so I grew up in a, um, a woodworking family. Both my parents are craftspeople. And um, from when I was born to about eight years old, my parents built a sailboat and uh, from scratch and they, they launched her. We sailed around the Puget Sound um, for my childhood. And then when I was 12, my dad built another sailboat um, for another four years. And then we, we sailed, sailed more in the, in the Puget Sound. So that's kind of where my, my love for the ocean came. And then over the last, I guess, uh, nearly 10 years, I've been um, working with conservation research scientists from around the, the Pacific studying uh, different subjects, but everything kind of related to the Pacific Ocean. So um, that's where my connection comes from. In the these past, pieces, oh, so sorry. Go ahead and finish what you were going to say about these pieces. I'll ask. Yeah, these pieces were um, the actual imagery for these pieces was taken just right out, uh, right outside of Port Townsend, where I live, on this um, Admiralty Inlet. But they were inspired by some work that I did up in Alaska, where we were doing um, bird surveys um, and in transects, and you could see this kind of ripply, sharp water up right up in the foreground, but in, in every direction and um, around around us, we were totally fogged in. And of course we didn't see very many birds on, on those transects, but these pieces can read individually and they can also read um, kind of like a film strip. Can I interrupt for just a second? Sure. The, uh, these look so much like photographs. So what is it that makes these special over just approaching the work with photographs. Why glass? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've thought a lot about that because I do play with uh, photography a lot. And for me, there's a lot of reasons. Um, one of them is just kind of that idea of creating a, an archival record where we're experiencing the world in such a huge transformative moment. Um, it's hard to imagine the ocean being anything other than what we've always known it as, but even just in the last 10 years, it's really changed dramatically. So I think we assume a lot about nature, but um, we don't really know what the future lies. So that's kind of one, one aspect of that archival record of these experiences of this specific. Um, and I think speaking to uh, that, the, when I'm in the presence of this work, as opposed to a photograph, there's a physical nature to this work. Uh, it's actually very, very physical in terms of your uh, emotions when you approach the work. It has, uh, you can almost feel the moisture, the water, as opposed to the glossy surface of a photograph. This texture gives you that sense. There's nothing, it's not like a photograph at all. Yeah, you know, I think that, Yerji and I talked a lot about that, and I think it has to do with you know, like a, a painting or a drawing isn't like a photograph either, even, even when they are very photographic looking. And I think that just has to do with the nature of something being handmade and the, 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 the maker's hand in, in the pieces. I mean, when I'm making these pieces, I'm recalling really specific experiences and trying to kind of evoke those um, experiences into the work and you know, despite the work being of really specific places and experiences, um, I'm also trying to, to make these 
connections to other other people's experiences or um, maybe they don't have experience of, in these type of environments and um, I know I spent a lot of time on my scope out um, here in these waters and I've never seen any work that comes close to uh, capturing that moisture the fog <laughs> the water as much as these pieces do you personally want to go up and physically almost touch the pieces because they have such a textual quality to them. They're Thank absolutely you. beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I um, I mean, I don't know how you'll appreciate me saying this, but I do, I, I do encourage people to, to touch the work because it, um, it is, it does have the relief there. And, and this piece here uh, to the right, um, that piece, I used a, a color um, a blue color um, called copper blue, but it struck um, in the fire polishing. So after I engrave the pieces, I stick them back into the kiln um, and they polish out a little bit. But this piece, um, the blue in there struck, so it almost looks a little bit metallic and really has that reflection-y look that, that ice can have um, when it's very clear looking. I know in some of the pieces too, you not only uh, engrave on the surface of the glass, but you engrave uh, behind the glass so the light can penetrate the piece the more easier. Deborah, if you were to go over to that far wall, I think you could point out some of that area where she's carved actually behind the glass too to get, allow the light to come through. That piece That's on the far right has it. And then this piece here, well, both of these pieces actually are cut in different ways to let light through. Um, the piece on the right, I've layered uh, white and then I've got um, a light blue color, which you can see kind of along the horizon on the edge. And then I've got a dark gray color. So on this engraving, I've carved through the white to, re to reveal the dark color and then I've also cut from the back. Um, I'm pointing at my computer screen as if anyone can see that. Um, but I've, I've cut through the back to allow the blue to shine through. Yeah, and but then, you can kind of just put your hand behind there. It's really nice to be able to see the shadow. Yeah, there you go. There you you can go. really see how much light is transmitted through the piece. So, and I think that's something else to point out is the fact that you place these on these stands so that they lean out from the wall so that the light is possible and likely can go in behind the piece as well. Yep. Which I think is a brilliant solution to mounting and showing off the pieces. Yeah, I had, I had these pieces, we were debating how, um, my husband makes the brackets for me and we were kind of debating how we should install these pieces and I, had them in my studio leaning up very similar to this and the natural light in the afternoon kind of shimmered over them and um, it seemed to work, it seemed to work well. I like this work um, in, in kind of a natural light setting. They, they seem to change throughout the day. Also, I think the fact that they're leaning like that, I've noticed that they, because of the way they're lit from above, the light refracts off the piece back at you at a different angle. Mm. I think it enhances the kind of quality of light that you're getting off the piece. Cool. Yeah, I've seen them in my studio very quickly and then of course in the gallery a little bit, but I was uh, yeah pleased with how they looked there. The other piece next to this one um, shows a little bit different style of layering the glass where I have um, a layer of white and then I've got a layer of uh, dark teal and then a layer of white again. Mm. So on this piece I've um, carved to the, the top layer of white and then where you see the lighter turquoise on the horizon, uh, that's where I've cut through the turquoise layer quite deep and to reveal the white underneath because it's a transparent color. So I don't know if everyone understands but She's actually um, layering this glass and fusing it. Uh, Deborah, if you could go to the side of the piece so you can see the edge, you can see where she's actually fusing different layers together prior to starting the carving so that you can 
have these different layers to work against. Which is really a very involved process. It's starting to be a part of the new uh, setup for this work was also getting a big kiln, which um, very exciting. So this the studio is is changing. It feels it feels really good. It feels like a, a good good new beginning for for new work um, and exploring. My husband and I just spent a week up in the San Juan Islands and um, it was the first time out on the water for a really long time and it felt uh, it felt really good to get out there. All right, guys. <laughs> Does anyone have any or do, do we do questions at the end, Sarah? We can do, we can jump in with some questions. Actually, somebody, I saw that uh, John Forson asked a question, how much do they weigh? You know, I didn't weigh them, but they're pretty heavy. The largest piece, um, you know, I, I didn't weigh them, but they're pretty heavy. They're, there are several sheets, they're about five sheets thick. Um, these ones are not very heavy at all. The, so those are on a French cleat bracket. The, the pieces on the shelves are, are the heavy guys, but I don't know. Did you pick them up? Do you, do you know, Sarah, how much they might weigh? Yeah, I would say, sorry that the phone is ringing in the background. I can't make it stop. <laughs> um, I, mm, less than 20 pounds, I think, but probably getting close there. Um, would be I my... think this one might be more than 20 pounds, I felt like. I don't know. We, we, we we made sure to put the uh, the bracket sixteen inches on center so they could hit studs, but um, they seem pretty secure. Yeah, they definitely feel very secure on the wall, um, and you know the way that you guys have designed the bracket. There's a lot of stability within it, so it's um, they were easy to hang. So thank you, April. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. There's a, another question from Katrina Russell asking how long these take to complete. They, uh, the actual engraving time, I would say is very comparable to working on the engraving lathe. Um, but they're faster to engrave in that I'm not trying to match up the panels. So, but they, they still take quite a while to engrave. So this piece, um, I forget the dimensions on this piece, maybe 17 by 19 by 29. Um, I would say each piece took several weeks. So I was working on basically the sh whole show all at once. So I was kind of picking them up and putting them down. I had the three pieces that are, are not quite a triptych, but almost a triptych. Um, I worked on those probably from January to July, but I wasn't working on them all the time. I was kind of picking them up and putting them down. And I did that with pretty much all of the pieces. I like to, um, what, one thing that was really fun about this work specifically was that just because there was the one panel I could I could work in that way that I haven't been able to to do before. Yeah. Um, Tom Caston just made a comment that they have a very calming effect and Tom I couldn't they, they totally do it's so peaceful in the gallery right now. And I think one of the things that kind of contributes to that and that sort of sense of like endless meditative space is that there's no figures in these pieces, April, which is unusual for your work. Oftentimes there's, if it's not a figure, there's the suggestion of a figure through a shadow or a reflection or something. What, um, how did you decide to remove the figures? Um, I just wanted to be, I wanted to create work that might help evoke those feelings that you only get when you're with nature and I, I, um, I feel like over the last two years or year and a half, we've really needed that feeling in our lives. And I know that I've needed that. Um, and I just kind of felt like making work that I would want to be around or work that felt calming or, um, you know, I, I definitely was, was hoping the work would, would have that sort of meditative quiet 
introspective feeling to it. Um, we, we've had enough stress in life lately. <laughs> um, why not reflect on the beauty of nature, you know? I like what you've said too. Um, I don't know if you've said it in this conversation, but you've certainly said it to me about your thoughts on um, just creating these uh, these seascapes or these beautiful landscapes that allow for us to enjoy the beauty of nature and feel that connection and that as being sort of a starting point for a conversation about conservation and global warming and climate change, um, as opposed to sort of a more didactic approach of kind of um, showing or teaching, just kind of allowing people to remember yeah. their experiences and, um, and reflect. Exactly. You know, I've, um, through the research I've been able to participate with, I feel really fortunate that I've, I've learned a lot um, through those experiences, but I also feel like at this time, this point, you know, we, we know about climate change, or if we don't, I don't know, I, I mean, I, I think I can assume that, make that assumption, but um, you know, I think we need to come to it on our, our own terms and um, the scare factors thing doesn't, um, doesn't inspire me very much. And when I start, when I think about things that inspire me to take action, it's usually things that I find inspiring or beautiful or, or, um, you know, Feel something that I can to. connect to. Yeah. Yeah. So these pieces too, about not having any figures, you know, when you're, the ocean is so expansive, um, really just wanting to, to show that. There were some moments at Pearl and Hermes where um, just felt like I was almost the, the only person in, in the world. And, and I wanted to kind of grab that, that sense um, in these pieces. For those of you that don't know, Pearl and Hermes was, um, is a, an atoll in the middle of the Pacific that I worked on in um, 2016. Uh, no people out there. <laughs> you know, something else I think of from a gallery owner and, uh, you know, uh, someone who sells paintings and is a background in art history, then, um, and you've seen the Impressionist painters and where they depict the landscape and or other oil painters who have used the landscape as a departure point. You know, it's, it's been a big part of art history and a movement forward to uh, abstract painting and then to minimalist painting. And now we see you here doing this realistic sort of engraving of landscapes and wondering how those fit, fit into the whole history of art and in, given what's going on in the world right now and with the environment and with the changing climates and stuff and the, with your use of the glass and the texture and stuff and bringing us into these paintings, they really fit into our 21st century approach to the world we live in. So I think they're really, really important works that have a real merit in our current time. Oh, thank you, Bill. That means um, a lot, thank you. I want to just be a little conscious of time here. I know we want to see John's show as well. There's a couple more questions in the chat that I want to make sure we get to before we switch. Um, so do you strictly engrave the work or do you sometimes sandblast or scratch the surface with hand tools? Um, I, well, that's a tricky question. I mean, I guess I'm, I would say I'm engraving all, all I'm engraving it all, but it is with, hand tools with air with pneumatic air tools is what I, I used for this this body of work. I did use the engraving lathe on some of the smaller panels, but but not so much. I used mostly um, pneumatic uh, hand hand engraver tools or like a, a grinder tool. I took some pictures on um, Instagram of my tools, a very messy table, but they're all there. <laughs> um, and you provided us um, images of your tools, but I think we're a little short on time to jump over to that. So yeah, that's fine. Um, let's see, uh, how many layers of glass do you use? How many colors? 
So this is I've a very colorful cut, body of work. Yeah, I'm only cutting through the white, but um, these some of the thicker panels have more layers in them, but there's clear. So there's three layers of color and a, and a couple sheets of clear in the, in the larger, thicker panels. And um, from Judy, do you see these pieces as a starting point to bringing larger and more overwhelming experiences, especially because of the light you're bringing to the observer? Definitely. I would love to work on some larger projects. Um, and do you work, this is from Marsha Wiley, do you work with photographs or from memory? Or a uh, both. <laughs> Definitely a combination, sketches, memory, photographs, writings, poems, books, all of it. Yeah. Um, and if anybody, we did do a really uh, lovely printed catalog for this exhibition. If anybody um, who's on this call did not receive a copy and would like to receive a copy, just drop us um, either a note in the chat or uh, an email after the fact, and we can we very happily send you a copy. Because um, in it are a few little watercolors from April and as well as a few kind of uh, journal entries, quotes, things that she's thought of and they're quite poetic and um, I think are a nice compliment to the work. And thank you everybody for coming uh, to the Zoom talk tonight. I, I um... I really appreciate it. The Zoom thing is fun and weird, but it's really nice to uh, connect with people even through Zoom. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Traver, and everyone at Traver for all of your help with the show. Thank you, April. Support. Thank you. Um, OK, Deb, let's go check out John's show. And John, you want to turn your camera on and join us? Thank you. Hi. Hi. Yes. Where are you joining us from? Are you in your studio tonight? I'm in my studio, which is uh, in Seattle, um, kind of in the, the Ballard neighborhood of Seattle, in an old cookie and candy factory, and that's where I'm hanging out tonight. Cool. So, um, can, so the title of your show is a little bit enigmatic. It's Alpha Gem. Uh, I, I'm going to let you jump in there and describe as much of that as you like. <laughs> well, um, I've spoken a little bit about it, but um, so Alpha Gem, um, A Gem, Alpha Gem, uh, is uh, a constellation. And uh, like we haven't really written about this or, or talked about it much. Some of these fractograph shows, there's kind of a, a, a secret meaning behind them or a, a a secret concept behind the title of the show and, and in this case, the layout. Uh, so uh, Alpha Gem is a, a constellation that is part of um, the Gemini constellation, uh, also known as Castor. Uh, and it's very unique in the universe in that it's, um, it looks like it's one star with the naked eye but uh, under magnification, it actually consists of six individual stars. Um, and each of those is part of a pair. So it's uh, three sets of binary stars, which uh, apparently is a super rare thing in the universe. Um, not a, a, an astronomer even close to that by any stretch of imagination. Um, but I sort of, I liked the idea of, of uh, this idea that that without further examination, everything is one, but actually individual. So the show uh, title is, is inspired by that. And uh, you can see the layout of the, the fractographs is um, kind of related to that loosely as well, uh, three pairs. And so, um... One of the unifying uh, characteristics of this show is that all six of these pieces are made with glass that is the same color. Um, and but interestingly, because each of the pieces is a different thickness, that color shifts pretty dramatically from the thinnest piece to the thickest piece. Can you yeah. So about that. Yeah. So. 
again, six pieces. The show is very, um, I don't want to say minimalist, but, but, you know, I'm using all one color of glass, all the same dimension of glass. The only thing that changes is the position, um, the site that the fracture was initiated from, and the thickness of the glass. So all six slabs of glass are different thicknesses. Um, and the way they're arranged in the galleries from the thinnest glass, which is about an inch and a quarter thick, up to three inches thick. So they look like they're all slightly different colors, but they're actually all the same exact uh, batch of glass. What prompted you to do that? Did, was that, um, did you know when you got this glass that that was what you had in mind or um, is that something that kind of came to you uh, living with the glass in the studio? So I'm gonna back up a little bit and, and um, kind of talk about the fractographs in general and why I started doing the fractographs. Um, my background is in glass blowing. Um, I was uh, doing primarily blown glass work for, oh gosh, 20 something years. Um, uh, I was a, a member of Lino's team for 16 years. Uh, and, you know, I'd been showing primarily uh, these spherically based uh, blown glass objects that I think most people would know me for is the, the blown glass. And at about 2016, end of 2015, I had had some large optic blocks made with the idea of doing something uh, kind of architectural with them, some sort of fabricated sculpture. At the same time, I was looking for a way to, to kind of capture energy in three dimensions and was really interested in abstract expressionism at the time. So thinking about Jackson Pollock uh, and one of his canvases being a record of motion and emotion and time and place. And the thought was, how do you, how do you repeat that, but with a three dimensional object? Um, how, how would you do that with sculpture? And I was open to different ideas and, and different, different materials. Um, at one point I thought about, you know, building a, a glass furnace that uh, would be lifted up by a crane, you know, say 30 feet up in the air and pull a plug at the bottom of the furnace and do kind of a drawing in the air so the glass would cool on the way down and, and form this record of, of motion, you know, perhaps with a set of cables to, to pull on the furnace. Um, and then when these blocks arrived, uh, I said, ah, it was an aha moment. This is it. Uh, what I'm going to do is take a brand new sledgehammer uh, and hit each one. Uh, the rule was you only have one hit and whatever get whatever you get is what you get. You know, the idea was was to create this record of time and place and, uh, and energy and, and capture that in, in three dimensions. Uh, so the first one was Sledgehammer. The second iteration, really, I wanted to remove um, my physical energy from, from causing the piece to break. Uh, so what I did was I took molten glass and melted that down with a small crucible and poured that onto the surface of the glass. I thought about it as kind of, a, you know, like a drawing, um, and that would cause the fracture to initiate. Uh, and this iteration I call metamorphic fractographs, and this is removing it even one step further where I'll use a blowtorch and heat up just one small area and then pour a little bit of, of uh, cold water on it to create the thermal shock, which makes the piece explode. You kind of work on the floor of your studio. I do. I set things up on the floor of my studio, and uh, I have a big skylight and this old cooking and candy factory, which, which to me is sort of like the definition of, of this place is the skylight in some ways. So 
Um, you know, w when you see the video, the skylight is reflected in there and, and one shot, John Forson, who was the videographer on, on the, the shoot, actually captured a crow flying over right before um, we torched the block and it broke. You know, it, it's it's kind of a scary thing, actually. Um, I, I wear a face shield and, and gloves, and um, you know, these are not inexpensive uh, pieces of glass to begin with. So there's there's something for me as an artist about the, the process of letting go of this this beautiful, perfect object too, and this process of of, of transformation, metamorphosis, um, which you know. Is a, is a theme that I think kind of harkens back to what I do with the spheres as well. Um, the, the whole idea of, of change and letting go of something. You know, it's interesting you talk about um, the relationship between these pieces and that of the abstract expressionist painters and that idea of sort of capturing energy, the energy of the artist and that moment in time and making a record of that interaction with the object. Um, but unlike with those paintings, these pieces are like, so they continue to be mutable depending on the light. Um, and as you walk around them, like they're like, there's so much color that shifts and changes constantly in these works. Um, and I don't know, Deb, maybe if you look at the front of this piece, we might be able to see a little bit of what I'm talking about, the, the, where the fracture lines actually like become these sort of uh, pathways for light to kind of play in the interior of, of these blocks. These are constantly changing. Well, that's one of the best qualities of glass, right? Is, is, is light, how light moves through it. Um, it's not the same with any other material, including acrylic. Uh, glass has unique properties that uh, that sort of lend itself to, to, I guess, naturally being beautiful, which is one of the knocks against glass too, right? You, you know, I read an object, not an object, I read an article really early on uh, in, my, in my career. And one of the things that it pointed out was there's jealousy among people who work in other mediums because of just the inherent beauty with a clear blob of glass. You know, a blob of glass on the floor is still beautiful. Um, so it, it, it does a lot, but also I think, um, I don't know, kind of learning sort of how to use the materials of, of how to use the properties of the material too has been like one of the journeys for me, I think. Can you talk a little bit about how you use balance in your work? Um, one of the things that's different about this series of fractographs is the way that you have them positioned on the stands as though they're kind of sus suspended mid fall through space or um, as there's this sort of sense of motion as you look at the whole installation. Um, and that's something that you have played with um, not only with the fractographs and their placement on the stands, but with your blown glass forms as well. Yeah. I. Uh, you know, my journey as an artist started when I was about eight years old and I grew up in this remodel. And, um, you know, one day I picked up a pile of mud and formed it until it became a perfect sphere. And I took this little, this ball of mud and I put it in a clear glass dish behind my shed and I left it there for months. And I'd go and visit it and say, oh gosh, look at this perfect object I made, it's beautiful. And one day I brought it out and I showed my friends and said, hey guys, check out what I made. And they said, there's no way you made that. It's too perfect. No, really, I made this. Well, there's gotta be a golf ball or a tennis ball or something else inside of there. There's no way that you just made this with your bare hands. Well, I did. Well, prove it. So there I am faced with this decision. Do I return my perfect object to the shed or do I break it and prove my friends wrong? And as I'm standing there looking over the broken object on the concrete, casting shadows, Questions arose, what's more beautiful, together or separate? 
intact or broken. And that experience really struck a chord with me and, and, and stuck with me. I mean, granted, I was probably a strange little eight-year-old thinking about these things, but, um, you know, when I started uh, uh, making the, the spherical objects, part of what that was about was number one, my love for the, the, the form that started when I was a kid, but also positioning it in a way that it looked like it might be precarious. So it's important that, you know, the material is, is glass for this. If these objects were made from acrylic or, or if they were cast out of bronze or, um, would you might feel some kind of sense of concern for you know breaking your foot or the floor but not necessarily any reaction to the object itself uh, and so the use of glass hopefully allows me to kind of invite the viewer into to, to have this feeling that wouldn't exist with the use of another material um, and so really positioning the fractographs in this way um, was, was twofold. Part of it was, you know, related to tumbling through space and, and, and the constellations. And, and second was really just wanting to create that feeling eh, for myself and for the viewer of perhaps precariousness that may or may not be real. Can I add something, John? Yeah. Um, you know, I've been watching a lot of this um, space travel with SpaceX and with uh, the various different uh, stations that are spending, sending satellites up into space. And a lot of it's all about this gravity-free space and people. And these really, the way they're placed on these stands really make me think a lot about gravity-free. These are floating. They allow them to float in the space. Here in the gallery, they really look like they're just floating there. There's, you know, because because they they, they do appear to be floating. Even the stands themselves, the way they're positioned in the gallery with no bases, allow that to float even more. So it's like gravity-free space. And then the objects themselves, because they're all neutral, like that blackness of space. And the way you look down at the planet and see the cities and the way the lights grow and some expanding of the sort of randomness of the lights of space. These are all about space and all about um, a new universe we live in. I really, like that perspective on it. Yeah. It's really beautiful. Hey, Deb, can you just stand um, so that we can see the side of one of these pieces? I think so. Uh, one of the things that I really enjoy is how these can almost disappear. The way that you've designed uh, the stands, it's a good shot, thank you. <laughs> um, so that they are the exact thickness of the piece. Like you end up from certain angles, it's just a vertical line. Uh, and then you take a step to the left or a step to the right and suddenly this thing emerges um, and reveals itself to you. These are really like no other sculptures I've ever seen, you know, um, when you go through museums throughout the world, I've never seen a sculpture approach sculpture this way, you know, it's uh, totally unique. One of the things I love about your work, John, is how you, um, even though you've made this enormous departure from doing the blown glass work, you incorporate all of your knowledge about glass and the way glass works in these pieces. Um, and it's so apparent, you know, I think at first glance, people see like, oh, well, these are, these are blo broken blocks of glass, you know, what's kind of the big deal here? Where's, where's the, where's the craft in this? But in fact, like the way that you're using these optical blocks and you understand how a polished surface can be either a mirror or a lens, um, depending on the angle that you're looking at it or the way that light moves through it. Um, the way that the cracks are going to propagate through the glass, um, the unpredictability of that, the way color and density relate to one another. Like that's all decades of experience with working with this material and really having like an incredibly deep understanding. 
All it has, that a lot to, has a lot to do with science too. You know, the way the glass and the fractures work and the speed at which these it moves and the heat and the cold. You could talk a little bit about that. You, you talked a little bit about that aspect of it. Could you fill us in a little bit about how fast that those fractures occur? Yeah, so um, fractures propagate through brittle materials uh, at the speed of sound that, uh, at the speed that sound travels through that material. With this particular type of glass, this is a type of what's called borosilicate crown glass. Uh, those fractures travel between nine and 11,000 miles per hour through the material. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, what these are essentially is, is an indelible and irreproducible record of time and place. Uh, and, you know, they do explode, they do come completely apart and they go back together several times before they're adhered. Uh, but really part of what I wanted to do with this was have a conversation about the why and less about the how. And I think some of my search for, you know, expressionism, right, being expressive was wanting to move beyond the hand, really. Uh, and not that I don't have a, a, a huge amount of respect for uh, making nice things and, and being able to do that and skill. Uh, the opposite is true. I mean, I do. I, the opposite is not true. I have a huge amount of respect for it. Um, you know, but gosh, I wanted to, I wanted to say something else. <laughs> what, what is the, uh, you actually glue these pieces back together. What, what is the adhesive you use to put those back together again? Um, it's a two-part epoxy. Uh, it's incredibly strong. Um, it's used a lot in the fiber optic industry. Um, and it's very, it's kind of tricky to work with. Uh, so, you know, the piece explodes and pick up the pieces and, and you have to clean in between all of the fractures and, and put it back together several times uh, until you know how to, how it goes and, and, and then it gets adhered with the epoxy. Um, and the epoxy very closely matches the refractive index of the glass. So if you use too much, you can actually make the fractures disappear. So you have, you have to kind of be careful on how you do that as well. So how many, um, how often do you cut yourself when you're doing this? Oh, frequently, <laughs> yeah. I think on uh, one, one day, one day I cut myself like five times and I, I kept track on a body of work for a, an exhibition at, at Traver a few years ago and it was like 36 times I cut myself, I think. And it's not because I don't wear gloves, the, cut, the glass is so sharp that it cuts right through the gloves. I, I think it might be interesting to note that these pieces are sitting in, in here, they're not glued to these stands, they're just sitting there, the weight of the piece alone supports it in that stand, is that correct? That's correct, yeah, just gravity. So we're right at six o'clock, um, but I don't wanna cut off anybody's questions. Um, I've got a nice comment in the chat from Tom Kasten, which I'd love to share with everybody. Um, and then if anybody else has any other questions, please feel free to jump in. Um, Tom says, between the serenity and calmness of April's work and the creative destruction and the big bang of John's work, the exhibition is fascinating. Both their work captures the emotions that many people are either feeling or longing to feel. And I really couldn't agree more, Tom. That's really nicely said. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Tom. Um, and Judy shared that for me, the sculpture is about time, the notion of capturing an instant and freezing it for as long as the material lasts, it demands we pay attention and think about it. Totally agree, Judy. And both, uh, I think John and April play with that notion of being kind of record keepers um, in very different aspects. Uh, but, you know, that's something that comes through really strongly in this exhibition, I think. Anybody else have any questions they want to jump in with? Yeah, I want to say that. Oh, sorry. 
Go ahead, Bill. Go um, ahead, Richard. You jump in. Let's hear from you. I was just going to ask John about his sculptural uh, influences. Uh, who are the sculptors that you're looking at that inspire you? Obviously, you come out of a, um, a, a glass conversation, but it's also obvious that you're looking at um, what, what appears to be kind of minimalist sculptures, uh, sculptors uh, as some part of that inspiration. I'm just interested if um, you're happy to speak to that. Sure. Um, you know, Gosh, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a sculptor. And uh, there was a local uh, guy here, his name was George Sudakawa. Um, ironically, uh, Rachel's husband, Zach, worked in the studio uh, with uh, George's son, Jerry. Um, and I, I tried to be an apprentice to George. He was retired. Um, you know, this was when I was about 18 or 19, I think. Uh, so, you know, I think sculpturally, gosh, Influence wise, although this body of work doesn't reflect it, um, Barbara Hepworth, uh, yeah. for sure. Um, George Sudakawa, uh, for sure. I think some people with some of the more recent uh, tower pieces would, would see a little Joel Shapiro in there, maybe. Um, so, you know, of course, gosh, Richard Serra, perhaps. Yeah, for contemporary sculptors. Yeah. Donald Judd, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, Donald Judd, for sure. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I would think that um, I'd like to hear about some of your influences, too, Richard, because I, I see, uh, I don't know, a common thread and some aesthetically you're I relate to your work. Yeah, uh, it's one of the reasons I asked the questions. I see a connection there. We can take that offline. Yeah, let's, but, um, you know, going into this, I was, I was thinking about uh, part of what has allowed me to do the fractographs is building a knowledge of the material and technique and, and being able to let go of that. Uh, but there's, there's more to learn. So we, have, we need to talk about that too. Well, I think everyone should if you have an opportunity to come and see the show. You should definitely see it in reality. If there, the two shows in the gallery look fantastic. Yeah. Beautiful. And thanks, space. you guys, uh, Bill and Sarah, and uh, for uh, the opportunity to um, to have an exhibition. Uh, it's been, I think, challenging times for galleries and artists, um, and it's not without. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an honor um, and a privilege to be able to, to have an exhibition. So thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. Uh, I guess I'm, also, I just want to say thanks to everybody who tunes in and takes the time out of their evening to participate in these events because um, the audience, I mean, a gallery and an artist's work um, don't really exist without an audience. So it's really important mm -hmm. that you all are here joining us and so thank you very much for for taking the time and being participants thank you thanks guys yeah all right i think we'll call it a night um if anybody has any follow-up questions or wants to get a catalog in the mail please just let us know reach out um and of course we're happy to share price lists or further details with it with you. Um, and yeah, as Bill said, if you can come in and see the shows in person, they're really extraordinary. And John and April, thank you for sharing your beautiful work with us. We're very, very proud to represent it. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.